Okay. Did yeah, you pl just plug your camera yeah. or was it already plugged? Just a minute. We've uh, just clicked yeah. on Here we are. Sorry for that. Okay, we can see you now. Perfect. Okay, Wait. so you can mute and unmute yourself right next to your name, okay? Uh, okay? Whenever you don't want to speak, you can mute yourself, okay? I'll mute myself now then, so I won't uh, distract Perfect. everybody over there. So your picture, your video will be shared also on the Ooh. screen in the room, okay? Do you have any pr uh, PowerPoint presentation to share? I cannot hear you. Do you have any yes, PowerPoint I, presentation I, I to share? Yes, I, I did. Um, I sent around a uh, presentation. Um, just actually, we're just about to uh, we're just about to hit send to you uh, just a second. Okay. Do you have PowerPoint slides? Yes, I yes okay. I do. Okay. Do you have them now on your computer? Uh, on uh, a uh, the computer that's next to the computer that we're discussing this over. Yes. Okay, but uh, c could you? I mean. You need to have them on this computer that you connected yeah, from. Yeah, now we're, we're, we're going to do that. Give a, mm -hmm. a, 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 like a um, memory stick or something. Like that. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So we'll, we'll hit, just stop, stop messing around. Yeah, done. Yeah. Just hit, 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 so it goes over. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get this over just in a second. We're just Okay, I just uh, need to, to, to go to uh, the top menu. On the top mm -hmm. menu there is share. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then file. And then yeah. you choose the file from here, your presentation file, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you'll be able to uh, broadcast your uh, presentation through the remote participation platform, okay? Got it, got it. Yep. We'll, we'll, we're just doing our last uh, thing to uh, get that over to this, uh, the, the right file to the right computer so we can get that uh, shared. Okay. Um, because they're, they're about to start, and I think yes. you're next. Uh, uh so I'm we gonna, need to make okay. this work. Okay. Well, w let's see. This is the. Uh, wait, this, this is the. We want to make sure that we get the right. Pre yeah, this is in, this is no. This is the internet government. Uh, this is uh, the standard for digital. No, no, no. This, is, in, uh, this is the. This yeah, is the economic. room number three. Economics. One forty-three. Okay. Make sure. Okay. Yeah, economics. Economics. Great. Room number one is okay. there. Go down, I pull down. These are all keep going, 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 yeah, we're uh, just uh, just getting it over to the right machine. Just uh, we'll have to be there in uh, because I have thirty to leave seconds. The room very soon, so, um, okay, well, we're we're uh, we're in two and a half. Can you pull it up now? Yeah. Okay, great. So we can see both of you now. Mm, good. <laughs> I'm not got the name. You'll get it just for yeah, you. Yeah, you, you got it. You got it. Yeah, I know. So do you have the presentation on your computer? Uh, yeah, we're just getting it up. So, uh, Lee is preparing, is putting his presentation. Is he next, or? We'll be there in uh, 30 seconds. There it is. No, no, he will, will. It will be on the screen. Don't worry. Yes, you can start. By that time, uh, Lee will have okay. his presentation. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, Lee, R Lee. Yes. Uh, the, the, the uh, okay. Sorry, presentation is here. So uh, the moderator will start, and you're next. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna get people dizzy over there and keep moving. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you should probably let um, 
the other conference, you know, the, okay. the panelists know that I'm starting here and then I'll go over there. Okay. Okay, but I'm going to say, I'm not hearing this, but I'm seeing like there's. Or is that just showing that? Yeah. That they're, they're, it's not, they're not, they're, I'm not missing that anything. That is the third one, right? Yeah, yeah okay. So, hello, everyone. We're, we're about to get started with uh, workshop number uh, 143 here on measuring the internet economy, um, how we can inform policymakers about social and economic impacts. Are, are you able to hear me? Okay, good. My name is Taylor Reynolds. I'm from the OECD and I'll be moderating this session. We'll get started because we have a, a stellar panel here that's going to talk about measurement issues and why it's important to understand the importance of the internet economy from a social and economic standpoint. I'd like to begin today uh, by setting the stage a little with a PowerPoint that I put together, and then I will toss over to uh, each, of the present, each of the panelists who will talk for roughly seven to 10 minutes, provide you with insights from their perspective, and also give you an introduction about themselves and what they're doing. So I'll move over and uh, continue this presentation from the uh, computer. Okay, thank you very much. I, I just want to give a roughly five to seven minute presentation here about some of the work that the OECD has been doing on measuring the internet economy and why we think it's important. So uh, policymakers around the, the world really stopped for a moment for a period of self-reflection on the 28th of January 2011 when it was announced that uh, the internet had been cut off in Egypt. Now, this was a defining moment, we think, in terms of the internet economy because it really forced policymakers to think about what is the economic value of this infrastructure that we continue to rely on more and more, and what happens when this network connectivity is cut off. And one of the things we've been talking about at the OECD for a long time is the economic and social impacts of the internet. We know that the internet has this channel where it affects the economy across all different sectors in a social and economic way. But one of the challenges that we face as in the OECD and in, as policymakers in general is it's very difficult to measure the economic impacts of something. And that's why we need good statistics, we need good models, and we need the right ideas behind this. So I, I wanted to put forward a question. why? Why is measuring the internet economy such a difficult task? And I'm going to give you an example. Junkyards. Now this is something, uh, a junkyard is a place where uh, when you have an old car that doesn't work anymore, you take your car to the junkyard and uh, it's sold there for scrap parts. That means you can go to a junkyard, you can buy different parts for the car uh, when something breaks on your own car. But what they do is they aggregate all of these old cars together. Whoops unauthorized change. So the difficulty here is that junkyards are not typically considered part of the so-called internet economy. So in a traditional sector what you would do is you would say the internet economy are, is businesses that operate in such and such sector. But junkyards are very far from what we would typically count as the internet economy. We would keep that fully separate. But something interesting has happened in the market for junkyards, and that is they have moved their model, adjusted their model, and moved in a lot of times almost fully onto the internet. They used to be this, this very local service that would sell parts just to people around who could drive, visit the junkyard, and see if they had a certain make or model of a car. And now what we're seeing is that junkyards are actually becoming e-commerce sites that sell across Europe and across the world. Um, I, I put up a site here. This is a, this is a French uh, junkyard out in an area that's rather remote. And what they do is they sell their parts for their cars across Europe and across the world. You can see that their website, this is for a junkyard, is available in two, four, six, seven different languages. So what they're doing is they're marketing their parts over the internet. And what we see is that junkyards have become an integral uh, user of the internet. And so it's very difficult for us to say, well, 
how do we measure the, the uh, input of junkyards into the overall internet economy? So what we did at the OECD is we decided this is such an important issue for us to understand as policymakers are considering, for example, rolling out infrastructure, considering what are the policies for an open internet, that we thought we need to have some good measures of the internet economy. So what we did is we held an expert roundtable back in September 2011 where we brought together uh, more than 50 academics, private sector people, think tank workers, consultancies and governments together to talk about uh, how we come up with, me with uh, methodologies for measuring the internet economy. We asked Bill Lair of MIT to come uh, moderate the discussions and we commissioned five different papers that looked at different aspects of the internet economy and you can see the list there. They're available on uh, the OECD website if you're interested. And what came out of this, of this research that we did at, of this expert meeting was essentially three different approaches that can be used to measure the internet economy. On one hand, we'd like to know what is the direct impact of the internet. In other words, what is the percentage of business output or the percentage of GDP that can be tied to the internet? That's approach number one. Approach number two takes a more dynamic look and it says things like, uh, if you have the internet, how is that going to help the economy grow? So what's the dynamic? How is the internet in increasing the size of the overall pie in the economy? And then third, we thought, there are plenty of things, plenty of benefits of the internet that are not captured in monetary values. So we need a way to measure, for example, what is the consumer surplus that comes from the internet and these are the indirect impacts. So based on the statistics and the data that we have access to in the OECD, we thought we would begin by looking at approach number one and approach number two, uh, where we could leverage existing data and uh, work on value added that the OECD has done for approach number one. And we could also do some of the academic studies that look at how the internet affects employment, how it affects GDP growth. And we've done that in two different areas here. So I'd like to talk about one of our, our key results. We started out by using data from the United States. And we think this is a, is a very important finding. We looked at um, value added, which is the value created by businesses in the United States. And we found that at least 3% and up to 13% of the United States business sector value added can be attributed to internet related activities using national statistics from the United States. And this was in 2010. What we did is we, we took a narrow view at first where we said, what if we just look at the information sector plus wholesale and retail, which is a small percentage. And we say that that accounts for 3% of the value created by businesses in the United States. But when we expand this across, across the whole economy and we look at the junkyards, we look at manufacturing, we find that up to 13%, it's a much larger number of the economy is now based on the internet. So for us, this is an important finding that highlights the internet is no longer just one sector of the economy. It is a platform like electricity, like water that is used across the entire economy. So the results of our study can be found in our Internet Economy Outlook, which was launched in October 2012. And then because we are an economic organization, we have a methodological working paper that's 140 pages long that spells out everything that we've done. So for researchers, they can pick through and say, uh, this, is, this is something that works. Maybe we can improve on this in the future. So today we've got this great panel assembled to talk about uh, several things. For example, why is it important that we understand the internet economy? So what, what is the importance for policymakers to understand this? Second, what type of analysis do we need? Um, this is a fictional example, but do we want to be able to track how a country is growing with the internet economy over time? If so, we need statistics now. Uh, another fictional example, do we want to be able to compare countries in a benchmark? We want to be able to say, look, my country is doing better than this country or, or we're struggling here. And in order to do this, we have to come up with some, some common standards, some common data sets that we can do this with. And then finally, I think one of the things that would be great to touch on is people here at the IGF understand the importance of the Internet. I think the fact that you're here, 
uh, and that you're trying to connect to the internet all day shows that we understand the importance. But how do we convey this to policymakers who may not be as in touch with the need for internet access? So I, I'd like to uh, turn it over some time to the panelists here. I have to say that Patrick Rang from Google is uh, not yet on this list, but he is here going to participate with us. And uh, we'll start off with a remote participant. Uh, I'll ask Lee McKnight from Syracuse University to give us an academic perspective. Lee, if you can hear me, uh, it would be great if you could introduce yourself and then um, begin by talking about some of your own work. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Taylor, and it's uh, great to be with you. Um, I hope you can all hear me all right. I'll assume that's true. Okay, so uh, without uh, further ado, I'll just uh, jump in uh, live from uh, Syracuse University, and uh, it's great to be with you, at least virtually, in Baku. Let's get to the next slide. Um, so just a little bit about my own work in the area. Uh, I've been at this, I guess, that's what that's, if you can see my picture here and see the gray hairs, I've been doing this uh, for a while now. Uh, the, we or, organized a, a workshop for the National Science Foundation back in 94, uh, uh, trying to bring together engineers and economists to really start understanding, uh, well, the, the, how the, the internet could work and be analyzed as an uh, economic system. Uh, that, after some further work, became the book uh, Internet Economics, uh, which uh, we take, at least uh, me and my uh, co-editors and authors, uh, claim is the, the first attempt to do what we're trying to do, we're attempting again now. Um, and uh, what I have to say is it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy back then, and it's, it's not, I don't think it's gotten any easier uh, today, even if we have uh, made a lot of progress uh, with uh, the great work of the OECD and others over the intervening period, but it's still a very complicated uh, challenge. Um, so, so we know, I mean, we all have this kind of intuitive feel. We know that this, uh, the Internet's having this big impact and it's growing, but really trying to get at, as, as Taylor already noted, you know, the causality relationships. It's all, it's a, in, in, in a real world context, it's very, very difficult to get sort of a clean, uh, a clean sample or a clean study in which you could really uh, show causality. We do know that having sort of, uh, you can sort of observe that having national governments organize and plan for and work towards bringing broadband to sectors, additional sectors and communities. Um, it, it seems, at least you know, from what we can gather, as having positive impacts on a broader basis. Um, but really going from the plan to the impact analysis is still a, a challenge. Uh, I should note that over this in intervening period, you know, developing basic metrics, and again, the, the OE it's, it's not, not to uh, uh, underplay how difficult it is to do what the OECD already does in terms of the data collected and analyzed, but at least we have now these basic metrics and we can sort of do some level of comparison on uh, prices, on available top speeds, uh, and, and that has uh, come a long way from uh, back in the day when uh, there were no measures of the internet or even or broadband at, at all. Uh, but now turning to wireless broadband, uh, life's a little more complicated now when there's a more, it's not quite true yet that there's more mobile devices than people, though it probably is if we expanded the range of devices to be covered beyond uh, just uh, mobile phones. Uh, the point is this is not very far off at all. And uh, so there's, there's huge quantities. Some of these are broadband, some of them have internet access, some of them are still, uh, many of them still in various parts of the world are still 2G, so they may have some basic uh, services, but not something that we would call uh, broadband. Uh, so again, with Bill Lair, uh, actually that first article, three, we, we, he and I wrote a paper on uh, 3G, trying to co compare and contrast different types of uh, wireless broadband services, more or less emphasizing mobility versus, uh, I guess, bandwidth. In the case of 3G versus Wi-Fi, uh, Bill Lair and I wrote a paper uh, some quite some time back looking at this kind of contrast. Uh, the next level of contrast we could go into is like LTE versus WiMAX, but that's already, you know, like a, one's, one's not quite dead and buried, but it's certainly been left behind by the rapid uptake of LTE uh, worldwide. Um, but And there's many other kinds of, of services, uh, whether it's Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, or now uh, mobile cloud services, or the wireless grid services 
that uh, I'm involved in, uh, and my, my colleagues in, in um, uh, developing standards and applications for. So I guess one of the points I want to bring forward is that we have the general category of internet, and then when we get into the specifics of like what's actually happening in the economy and what are pe how are people accessing the internet, uh, which is dynamically changing uh, across across from uh, wired and wireless networks, uh, we 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 have a real challenge sometimes at getting to the the comparables. Like what 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 is how can we what what is 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 a uh, is LTE and WiMAX really about the same? You know what? It is pretty much. Uh, but when we get into mobile cloud services, maybe we should be rethinking uh, what we're uh, valuing or how, what, what are the right economic metrics, which I'll get to next. Okay, so if we just look at this, for example, we've been talking about economic uh, indicators, and one of the biggest is, uh, or one of, one of the largest ones having an impact in the broader internet economy here is, you know, presence or availability of unlimited data plans, as, a, as it's still common. It's not white, all, you know, uniform in the U.S., but that has a significant impact on usage, on advertising, and all kinds of other uh, measures. Uh, which is not it's not, a, it's not it's not a question of how fast is the network it's not a question about how widespread the network is it's just a question of like essentially marketing preferences of independent businesses or perhaps regulation uh, whether or not unlimited data plans are available uh, or it could be a question of economic structure whether the market's oligopolistic and there's no reason to uh, offer anybody for any uh, entrant to offer unlimited data plans or is there enough competition where that can be a significant differentiator. Um, so I'm just trying to highlight saying that we have to think beyond uh, some of the basic measures now at this time as we look to the future. Uh, I do note, and I'm sure that uh, you know this, the, 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 oh, this well uh, referenced uh, Arthur D. Little, Erickson, uh, Chalmers study saying, hey, we can, we, you know what, we can, we, well, I'm claiming uh, from an academic perspective this is very difficult. Another academic colleague, uh, Eric Bolin, with uh, those colleagues, said we have a very precise measure, and then the answer is uh, you double the speed and you get 0.3 percent. So this is a pretty simple message to the policymakers: put in, you know, s accelerate the network, you get you get 126 billion dollars, and you pass go uh, if you're the United States. Um, Okay, so looking more closely at that study, there's maybe some questions uh, about uh, whether that's, you know, universally the case or and how, how far that can be extended um, based on the work already done. We can, however, say, okay, we agree. I probably can argue that, you know, it's, it's, uh, even if we uh, quibble about the methodology, we can say that speed does matter. So even if I'm saying there's other metrics that need to be taken into account, we shouldn't leave out the ones that have been developed, and those, those, so those, I'm agreeing with Taylor that it's good to extend from the existing data sets as we watch, you know, this continued evolution of the internet. <coughs> excuse me, from dial-up services to uh, higher rates of speed and a range of different types of services. So it, all the statistics that one can get on that is probably good, even if we can, you know, whether it's 0 0.3 or 2, 0 0.2 or 0 0.4, it may vary quite a bit. <coughs> okay, and then here we get to the specific problem just because we you know double the speed this uh, this this uh, assumption that we just go like we we express we double the speed and now we have more uh, productivity our economy's grown well something else has happened in between and that's around essentially internet services and human behavior and uh, business structure and all kinds of other things that aren't really getting measured by just uh, you know the raw speed uh, so for example, to make it real simple, you know, you have a higher speed, uh, 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 dense wave division multiplexing fiber doesn't meet, you know, doesn't make your economy more efficient or, or more productive. In fact, there's a lot of those fibers lying around that are just essentially, you know, dark. They're just they're 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 available and nobody's lighting them up uh, all over all over Europe and North America. In other places, they're lit up and they're being used for productive purposes. But just the existence. In other words, so, so the existence of capacity on the internet or speed doesn't automatically uh, grow an economy. And now we get to the other problem. And I'm not sure if I'm a downer starting off the panel this way, but I say, well, I'm not sure we're really measuring the right things for the future. <clears throat> we, as we get beyond, we have these. We still need to have these basic basic measures that the policymakers may be more or less familiar with or can you know relate to, like uh, speed and uh, 
and, and some other service characteristics, but, but we're really getting into this as, as at least my own sense and my own research, recognizing that it's these uh, what we're calling internet service qualities and the economics of these service qualities matters more than these kind of raw metrics like broadband speed. Uh, and that, that's, now we're getting into, now we're getting, take it one step further, when, when it's not even that, it's not even the internet, it's like the virtualization of markets and global markets, that's really, that's I think where there's huge economic impact and that's tied to the internet, it's crossing the internet, it's more than the internet, just as Taylor's example about, you know, the, 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 um, the junkyard is still a junkyard, but it's now doing transactions in this, it's like it's now it's a virtualized global junkyard uh, that has a wider reach than it ever could have before. So with the virtualization of uh, resources, uh, which is really what cloud computing is about, um, we, we're, and we're, we're getting into uh, like a whole, you know, there, there's some examples of virtualized uh, realities or uh, like the whatever Second Life, which people are familiar with and people are sort of walking around and they don't really accomplish very much, but it's, it's gone much further now in that uh, essentially everything's happening on virtual machines, uh, cloud with cloud computing, a whole a major, uh, and the enterprises are virtualizing all resources, uh, which takes them to another whole level. So it means then that we have this uh, need to come up with new metrics that look at these uh, technical content and service features or even social features together and get at some, you know, how is innovation happening? Uh, so this is not, this is definitely not easy, but just to make it one concrete example here, uh, you know, Twitter, pretty big part of the internet economy, pretty insignificant user of bandwidth because they were just sending around these 140 character things, so it's, it's, not, it's not that it's be consuming a lot of bandwidth. I'm not sure how much productivity uh, Twitter helps, but getting back to that sort of social impact uh, on society, uh, we, we, we have to keep in mind that things like this that are very sort of, it just, just having a very a few you know, bits available, can, you can do Twitter, and it obviously had a huge impact in the Arab Spring and other regions. So, uh, which gets to saying we have to be thinking about the, like I said, the internet economy is an economy of services, and we, these pipes and infrastructure that underlay it are still important and they're sig still significant, but they're, from an economic impact part, they're a uh, smaller part. Um, so, uh, just to get to this bottom point here, if we're just measuring bandwidth, then uh, we're rewarding, you know, fat and dumb networks and punishing small and agile services uh, we, for policymakers, which would then be essentially we're rewarding the waste of energy and uh, harming the environment through inefficient networking. Uh, so that's not what policymakers, I would think, would want to be doing, but that's in effect what they're doing uh, if they're not developing any more sophisticated ways of looking at this next stage of the virtualized market economy. Okay, now, uh, if you would like me to spend the next uh, half hour or three hours explaining this diagram, I would be happy to do so. Uh, but, but the main point here is to highlight that we have uh, been working with the Enterprise Cloud Leadership Council, many major multinational CIOs who are essentially looking at virtual like well, billion subscriber China Mobile, Cisco, Alcatel Lucent, and others. Uh, so we're get, really getting to another stage, I guess my message is where uh, the broad, the internet economy now uh, is also a sort of a cloud economy, and that is coming on very rapidly, and will have a significant impact in, in terms of employment, in business structure, market structure, uh, that needs to be thought about, and um, metrics also developed for this new world we're entering into, which I won't elaborate on now. Uh, services like uh, Gridstream, I'll just highlight, are one of the things that can be offered in this uh, environment where we're essentially, like, with everything virtualized, you can share everything without moving it, and it may, again, be a more uh, network efficient way to um, manage your economy. Uh, final example here is that along with this environment, there's whole new uh, sectors for measuring things across, you know, from, from the cloud to the edge service. Um, 
and uh, but but the really a lot of the economic impacts are not really captured by this. You know, this may be a reasonably accurate picture of what happens from cloud to edge, uh, but this may be a reasonably accurate picture of what happens from cloud to edge, but not captured by the wires or the bandwidth. Finally, my last two comments, I'll wrap this up. Uh, so my first suggestion is that we see need to recognize that uh, internet service qualities are the containers of both the economic costs and benefits, and it's not just about the pipes and wires, and we need to be sort of measuring more uh, virtual things. And that is where I conclude here, is that this, there's a very profound impact on the global internet economy coming from the rise of cloud computing services and virtualization of resources that can save a lot of uh, money and really have huge impact on employment and many other aspects of the economy. But uh, I'm not sure, so I'm, I'm glad the OECD has its internet economy uh, you know, uh, outlook. It doesn't yet have its uh, virtual market of global economy uh, outlet going, but I'm sure you always have a need, you need to have uh, new reasons to do more new studies, right, Taylor? On that note, I'll stop. On that note, I'll stop. Thank you, thank you very much, Lee. A fantastic presentation. Uh, what we'll do is we uh, it worked out very well. We will go through uh, all the panelists, and then I think we take uh, questions with everyone at the same time. That way we can have a discussion that flows. Um, next, I'd like to turn to Nevin Taufik from the government of Egypt. If you can briefly give an introduction to yourself and then uh, give your comments. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Taylor. Thank you for inviting me. Actually, I'm here on behalf of the first deputy to the minister and on behalf of several divisions within the Ministry of Communication Information Technology that work actually on uh, attempts to measure uh, the Internet. So let me start first. Uh, I'm actually working in research and uh, policies uh, division within MCIT and uh, on strategic planning as well. Um, let me first uh, tackle actually the most important question of why measuring uh, the Internet economy or the economic and social impact of uh, the Internet is important for a country like Egypt, and I think that uh, many developing countries are in the same position as Egypt. You started your uh, talk today about um, actually the cut in the Internet uh, during uh, uh, January 2011, and I think that uh, one of the most important reasons why we need to have the socio-economic uh, study is to make sure uh, that decision makers understand very well the repercussions of uh, cutting or uh, blocking or uh, infringing on the freedom of the Internet. So it's like a protection mechanism uh, for actually the free uh, use of the Internet in uh, Egypt and in a developing uh, country. Uh, this is extremely important for us. Uh, the second uh, reason why a study of the socio-economic impact is so important is because actually um, it's very important to reflect uh, the investments that we have uh, in the Internet in the national budget. And uh, with a country like Egypt, we'll find that the national budget has many competing uh, challenges, many items that, are, uh, that have a big priority for us, including, of course, education, health services, subsidies. So when we come and talk to the government or talk to the cabinet and say that we have to allocate this or that, a billion pounds for uh, expansion of the infrastructure or the broadband, we have to explain very well what are the, um, the, the results, what are we forecasting in terms of results uh, for, uh, for such huge investment. So there are so, so many competing uh, challenges uh, facing a country like Egypt. Um, maybe the third reason would be that uh, it's very important for us, as Taylor has mentioned and the speaker before, the, the Internet is it's an all-encompassing technology. It permeates different aspects of the economy and different sectors. 
We don't have education without internet anymore, the health sector, of course, the subsidy sector, banking, finance, etc. But the most important is actually to be able to convince also decision makers in these sectors that the internet or ICTs are an important tool for them to fulfill their objectives and to have also budgetary allocations for that. So having socioeconomic studies in this respect or clear measurements would help us, uh, in fact, be very convincing with the different ministries or the different sectors of uh, the Egyptian economy. Um, finally, I would like to say that sometimes there is an inflated perception of what the Internet can do. Uh, we get the impression sometimes that the Internet can do a complete political change which we do have reservations about that. The same applies on the economy. The Internet cannot do miracles, but it can help maybe achieve some miracles. So again, having some solid, robust studies in this respect would maybe put uh, issues into the right perspective for the government as well as uh, for the population. For all these reasons, we encourage very much uh, having um, uh, well uh, done studies about the economic and social impact of the internet in Egypt. Um, what have we done in Egypt? We've done some, we've taken some important steps in this respect. Maybe um, I want first to thank the OECD and other entities that have been working in putting uh, measurements for this particular issue. And I would like to note particularly the study or the report of the OECD on the impact of the Internet in OECD countries. You have noted that um, there are difficulties in measuring the Internet and um, you have also um, mentioned that there are certain partial measures that can be grouped in three broad categories, uh, simple measurements, which are measures of adoption, economic measures, and technical measures. Let's say these are the foundations for, uh, for measuring actually the impact of the Internet. In Egypt, we have also started uh, in this direction. So we have periodical statistical reports that cover some particular uh, indicators related uh, to the Internet economy in, in Egypt. Let me go very briefly about that. We have infrastructure indicators economic indicators and indicators related to the ICT sector role in development. So what are the, some of the examples of the infrastructure measurements? We have, of course, the mobile and fixed telephone lines, number of subscriptions, fixed lines and mobile penetration, uh, estimated Internet users, penet penetration users per mode of access, proportion of households using Internet, international uh, Internet bandwidth, etc. Uh, these are just some examples. Moving to the economic indicators, which I think uh, these are the indirect indicators you have been uh, talking about, uh, Taylor. We look at the ICT sector revenues, including revenues of main teleco companies, ICT uh, communication sector revenues as a percentage of the GT GDP. Um, we look at ICT GDP at constant prices, contribution of ICT in real GDP growth rate, contribution of ICT to the Treasury, ICT direct employment, ICT expert as a percentage of total services experts. Moving to the measurements of ICT role in development, we uh, touch on the number of graduates of ICT training, number of IT clubs, ICT usage by households, ICT usage by private sector, internet activities undertaken by private sector, uses of ICT in government, pre-university usage of ICT, computer activities, uh, ICT usage in university, and internet activities in universities. Again, as I said, this is the foundation, but we understand very well the limitations of this approach, and that's why our information division at MCIT has started some studies on measuring the impact of the Internet on growth using an econ econometric model. This was done three years ago, and now they are uh, doing a second part for that, and in fact looking at different econometric models. They haven't decided yet which one they are going to use, and I believe uh, maybe the results of this workshop are going to be very important and very relevant to our information division unit to decide uh, what uh, methodology they will be using uh, for this. 
So this is briefly uh, what I wanted to tell you about uh, what we've been doing in Egypt. We have two other important studies that I would like to mention very briefly. We have an ONCTAD study that was done uh, three years ago as well. And in this ONCTAD study, there was uh, an analysis of ICT policies. But within the, the analysis of the ICT policies that has touched on different aspects of the ICT industry in Egypt, there were a very clear um, uh, recommendations concerning what we need to measure uh, in Egypt uh, to be able to grasp really the impact of the Internet. Education was a very important uh, sector in this respect. The other important study that I would like to mention actually is uh, the impact of broadband uh, on uh, the economy and let me uh, just share with you this is a study that was done in Egypt and its title is socio-economic assessment of broadband development it was actually done by the World Bank and uh, in cooperation with the Ministry of Communication and the National uh, Telecommunication Regulatory Authority and the study argues that on the basis of the Egyptian broadband market model uh, there is, they made the projection that uh, subscribers will surpass 11 million in, uh, uh, by 2020 and that revenues, uh, revenues will reach close to $3 billion uh, per year within the five-year forecast period. However, the investment required for that are 2.2 billion Egyptian uh, pounds. Um, I don't want to go into the details of uh, the assessment, uh, but I would like to mention uh, some of the remarks that the World Bank has made because they have uh, done a case study on education and they have noted actually um, the importance of having better data in education and the lack of uh, quality cost and impact data on ICT and education. Uh, cost data being extremely hard to obtain. So one of the main sectors where we need to have more studies actually and more uh, and better measurement is ICT and education. The impact of the use of cloud computing on uh, the education, uh, the impact of actually virtualization on uh, the, the rising skills of, uh, of our uh, student body. I have to mention that we have 18 million undergraduates and we have 40,000 schools. So I would say that the educational sector is one of the most important sectors that we need to mention and the impact of the ICT in uh, this particular sector. Uh, well, I'll stop at this point and uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naveen. Uh, it was very interesting to hear about the perspective from Egypt. I think what we'll do now is we'll move to Eric Aman from Facebook to give us a perspective from Facebook that has a lot of data that maybe could be used to help us understand the internet economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, I'm with Facebook now uh, since, uh, since a year. I'm, I was a member of the European Parliament from Germany until 2009 and uh, for 15 years, built my own uh, 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 company thereafter. I had a company before I joined the European Parliament as well. So, and I'm very familiar with the sector um, since, the, since the early 90s, maybe even before. Um, and my understanding is my feeling what we're trying to do now to capture the data uh, for, the, for the internet economy, it's extremely important, extremely relevant because it's, it's important for government, but it's important for legislator as a whole, because when you frame legislation, you want to frame legislation based on data and based on the right understanding how the economy actually functions. Now, there's some, um, when you look at it, um, we, we have to be very clear, the, the image we still have in our head uh, when, when we talk about the ICT sector and the ICT industry, it's still to some degree a quite old-fashioned uh, understanding because we are all, um, our, all our understanding, uh, including uh, to some degree all the studies uh, which we have seen so far are still very much based on the telecommunication sector, on the software industry, and um, I think we have a lack of understanding about the really truly new economy which relates to the internet sector as a whole and the internet economy. So my, uh, my sense of understanding what we have to do, and I'm very grateful for the, all the data the OECD did, uh, McKinsey did, many other um, actually studies which are out there on the market now. I think what we need to do, we have to be much, we need to tailor our understanding 
much more precisely on what kind of sector are we talking about. Are we talking about the social media business sector? Are we talking about um, the, the impact the search uh, industry gives to the, uh, to the internet economy as a whole? Uh, so what are we really capturing? What kind of data are we really trying to capture? And then we have to translate this into the right uh, recommendation and the right um, implications um, depending on what we want to understand and what we want to achieve. There's another factor I think uh, very important, but we haven't understood really well, is how um, the in internet economy really relates to the traditional uh, sector. Because when you look at it, um, most traditional sector, the car manufacturers, the logistic companies, the health industry, the, um, um, the um, insurance company, the banking sector, all of them use, of course, uh, the different uh, to ICT and to the new internet economy related sectors and data and they work with them, they implement them. Uh, and, um, the users are using many of the services through Facebook or through other social media uh, tools available on the market. So we, we really need to look into these effects as well to understand uh, the so uh, socioeconomic impact in the right way. Second, I think what is important, and I think Taylor, I think it was you who mentioned it, and, and uh, I think you as well from the uh, Egypt uh, ministry, it's we need to tailor it really so that we understand what kind of effect these data have on our own economy. Because our economies are very different. It's, it makes a big difference if we talk about an economy in, in uh, Germany or we talk about an economy in, in Belgium or in the Nordic country or Egypt or India and it's not just the it's just not on relevant to understand it on a country base but we need to really tailor it for the local markets we need to tailor it down to the regional markets it's a difference if we talk about Delhi or we talk about Bangalore or about Mumbai because they're different uh, sectors um, so we need to really understand this in the right way, and I don't think so we are there yet. Um, we did our own little understanding because Facebook is, again, very different. That's maybe the third point to understand as well, is really to understand this, um, the, um, the uh, different business model uh, based on the uh, new Internet uh, economy. Um, so, uh, Facebook is very different because we are what we call a platform-driven um, system. So we enable others to use our platform and to work on our platform, small companies, large companies. Um, and um, this is, an, I think, an, an economy which needs to be understood very well because it gives many opportunities for small business uh, from all over the globe uh, to use it uh, appropriate to their needs. Um, and so these, to measure these effects, it's very hard and very complicated. Now, we did a very short, uh, we did a study, uh, which was done actually by Deloitte, um, to understand these, um, uh, me uh, the, understand the measuring the e economic impact uh, Facebook has on, on the United States. So we did one study for the United States, and we did one quite recently uh, for Europe, uh, which was done and uh, came out in 2011. So, and I just give you some numbers, but please keep all my, my, uh, my points in mind that, of course, it's still very, we are very young phase and a pioneering phase of understanding all these data and understanding all these impact uh, the different um, sectors have on the overall internet economy. So what we came out, what Deloitte came out with was, for, these are numbers for Europe. So the central estimate of gross revenue enabled, enabled by the activities of Facebook um, is, three, uh, is in, in Euro 32 billion. Uh, the revenue converts into an economic impact of an, in Euro 50.3 billion and supports 232,000 jobs. Um, so when we say enabled, it means it, these are not numbers which come from our own activity only. They capture our own activity as well, but they capture all the activities by all of the partner firms we are working with. So either the partner firms which are using uh, Facebook as a platform or revenues generated through advertisement. So this is all captures in these, uh, in these numbers. 
so I think what we, uh, what we have to do in the future, we really have to understand these different sectors extremely well. And it would be great if actually the OECD could do such kind of study, really looking into the different, uh, based on the studies which are already available maybe, maybe even a meta study would be wonderful. Maybe we do not have to do, you know, generate a complete new study, but maybe use all the data available from Deloitte or from McKinsey, the one which you have done, uh, the one which are done on, uh, you know, from, from, from different um, uh, systems, uh, and then to measure them and see, uh, okay, these are the effect, effect which comes from social media, these are the impact which come from different internet-related uh, business models. Uh, just give you one little tiny example uh, from a, a small company, one of my, one of my favorite um, um, economy, uh, one of my favorite company. It's based in Germany. It was created about three years ago. It's still a small company, Voga. It's a game developer who works and, and uses the Facebook uh, platform. Um, they have more. If I'm, uh, they they um, have more than 60 uh, million users now generated on Facebook. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, their employment increased dramatically over the over the last three years. I don't want to give you the number. I I recommend you check out Voga because they hire so many people uh, monthly that I don't want to give you the wrong number and I don't want to give you the wrong numbers even about their revenues. You can find this, it's Woga, W-O-O-G-O. So Woga, a company in, in Berlin. And this is just one of the success stories. Um, and I've, I think we have to understand this so much better to really talk, talk about the positive effect the internet economy brings to our society and to our economy. Thank you very much, Erica, for that perspective and, and for the statistics. And we'll go check out wolga.de. Okay, fantastic. Uh, if we can continue with Bill Woodcock uh, to give us more of a technical perspective, because just to, just to put this in a little perspective, at the OECD we use a lot of statistics that are gathered from national statistical offices, but we should probably be looking a lot more towards the technical community to find out what statistics are available that we could use in these types of economic and social analyses. Hi. Um, so, uh, I, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I was one of the authors on the OECD's recent carrier interconnection paper, um, which looks at the circumstances and regulatory uh, trends in the connection between internet service networks. Um, and one of the things that led into that was a survey of the interconnection between uh, internet networks. So what I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about is what that survey, what the results of that survey were and uh, what conclusions we can draw from it. And that's uh, obviously a very different level than uh, these good people are telling you about the, the sort of overall economic impacts of the internet. This is delving down into the specific technical workings of the internet and the regulatory interaction with that. So um, really basically uh, what this survey was, was um, a evaluation of 142,000 uh, carrier interconnection agreements. That is 142,000 pairwise uh, agreements between carriers. The previous largest survey of this type had analyzed 16. Uh, <laughs> so it was a, a fairly large jump and we didn't have a lot of prior work to compare this to so the results were kind of kind of interesting in several ways. Um, so specifically what we asked is is the agreement formalized in a written document or was it just a, a handshake around a common understanding? Uh, does the agreement have symmetric terms uh, or if you were to reverse the names of the two parties in the document, would it have a different meaning? So in, in general terms, does that mean that value is being transacted in the document, uh, in, in the agreement, 
um, in an asymmetric agreement versus uh, a just documentation of common understanding in a symmetric agreement. Um, and then what's the, the country of governing law for the agreement? And then based on the results we got, we also evaluated whether the agreements were bilateral or multilateral. That is, was this, were these two parties, uh, two parties that had gone off and created an agreement that were unique to them, or were those two parties out of a larger group who were all signatories to the same agreement? Um, we're relatively happy with the accuracy of the results. Um, uh, in 1,032 of the cases, we had data from both sides, from both parties to the same agreement, and in 99 and a little over a half percent of the time, when we had results from both sides, they were in 100 percent, they were in complete agreement with each other. So that let us know that the accuracy of the results that we were getting from people, uh, of the reporting, was high. Um, so we got a fairly complete response. If you look at the red line here, that is per country, the number of internet service providers in the country, and the blue line is how many of those were represented in the responses that we got. Um, so uh, the U.S. was one of the lowest responding uh, countries. We got about 30 percent participation from U.S. ISPs. Um, one of the big findings that was very much highlighted in the OECD report is that uh, more than 99.5% of all of the agreements are not formalized in a, a written document. Um, so to sort of turn that around and say it in a different way, 99.5% of the time the two parties are in such great agreement on what the terms of the interaction are that they do not feel compelled to even write it down. So this is a, a pretty important result in that there are very few regulated areas of activity in which you could go to the regulated entities and get sort of a statement from each of them as to what the, the normal terms of business were and have 99.51% of those be identical. Um, but in the internet industry, if you go and survey people who interconnect with each other, you have 99.51% uh, agreement on the exact terms of the, of the, the interconnection. 0.27% um, had asymmetric terms, so a little over a quarter of 1% uh, of interconnection agreements in the internet have some value being exchanged in one direction or other that is, is asymmetric. It's not exactly the same in both directions. Um, governing law, um, not everyone responded uh, with governing law of their, their agreements, but uh, of the ones that did, uh, which was several tens of thousands, I think something on the order of 30, 40,000 of them, um, I've cut the 76 sort of middle countries out here. You can see a, there's a red line in the middle of the graph, and that represents the elision of 76 countries that were sort of in the middle. So we're just looking at the 10 most frequently and least frequently used. Um, what you see at the far uh, left-hand side is the U.S. and Canada, and the far right-hand side is uh, Romania and Russia. So in every case in which one of the two parties was located in the United States, the two parties chose to use the United States as the country of governing law for the agreement. And in no case where either of the parties was in Russia or Romania did the two parties choose, sorry, in no case where one but not the other of the parties was in Russia or Romania did they choose to use Russian or Romanian governing law. So it's, it's not clear that there's any major impact of this, but it is clear that the Internet industry as a whole chooses to use the governing law of countries that are friendly to the Internet industry. Um, 
So um, there's a little bit here looking at um, uh, who partners with who in terms of interconnections. So look, just taking the UK as an example there, uh, what you see is that 41% of the interconnection agreements in the UK are between two parties within the UK. Uh, the next largest partner for the UK is the US at 8%, Germany at 6%, Netherlands at 6%, Russia at 5 France at 4 South Africa at 2%, and all others put together 27%. Um, if you look at Germany, 32% domestic, Netherlands is the next biggest partner, Russia, UK, US, Poland, Bulgaria, France, Austria, Romania, 25% um, others. Um, one of the really unexpected results was the degree to which multilateral peering agreements are becoming prevalent. The sort of informal word on the street, if you were to ask around two years ago, which was when we began uh, doing this survey, was that multilateral peering agreements, that is, peering agreements to which there were more than two signatories, were a you know, a corner case, a, a minority thing indulged in by small ISPs. Uh, and they probably weren't significant in the aggregate. What we found is that, in fact, they are very significant in the aggregate. Um, it is also true that the largest carriers, by and large, do not indulge in multilateral agreements. But if you look at the number of addresses served, the number of routes served, the number of parties to the agreements, and the number of interconnections per party, the multilateral agreements stand out surprisingly. And that's where what you are looking at in this graph. So here, um, the number of interconnection partners is on the y-axis. So um, if, if we look at the extreme left side of the graph, what you're seeing is that uh, there are, uh, sorry, I'm really bad at <laughs> explaining graphs. Um, and I think, I think I may have this reversed. Anyway, um, the the number of interconnection partners, yes, that's why this is confusing me, because the label is wrong. Um, the number of interconnection partners is on the x-axis, and the number of uh, instances of each quantity is on the y-axis. So where you see these spikes of more than 100 instances of somebody with say 140 some odd connections, that's Hong Kong, that's an agreement in Hong Kong between um, about a hundred different internet service providers and they've all signed on to it, right? So that's about a hundred providers uh, who have uh, 142 uh, uh, interconnections each, right? So a hundred of those 142 are within that, and the additional uh, 42 are other agreements that that party has outside of that multilateral agreement. Um, so, sorry, 144. So uh, if we zoom in on that a little bit, you can see an agreement at 144. You can see an agreement at 154 that's in Warsaw. Um, there are a few other big ones. Uh, Frankfurt is a, a huge one. Um, the other thing that was kind of unexpected was the degree to which the traditional incumbent carriers have been bypassed by the mainstream. So uh, in, in terms of the number of interconnections. So uh, where you see on this graph the, the big vertical stacks, those again are clusters indicating multilateral agreements. but. Um, it's a little hard to see on the projector, but there there are 142,000 dots on that graph, uh, and they are spread out very much along the the red line there, which indicate, indicates the trend of number 
of interconnection partners on the x-axis versus size of network on the y-axis. So what you're seeing in the red circled area in the top left is a small number of networks that are very large yet are very, very poorly interconnected with the rest of the Internet. Um, and when we delve into which networks those are, those are typically national incumbents. Uh, and interestingly, identically sized networks on the content side, things like Yahoo and Facebook and Google and Akamai, are exactly on, on the trend line, right? They're, they don't stand out in any way. So we can look at two different kinds of networks that are in many ways directly comparable in terms of size, investment, you know, degree of participation in policy and regulatory processes, lobbying, all those kinds of things, yet uh, only a subset of them, only the sort of traditional incumbents, uh, are outliers in this way. So I guess that's kind of a an overview of, of the sort of uh, data that we're able to collect from this peering agreement analysis. We also do a lot of uh, work based on information that we collect from the routing topology itself, looking at uh, what, what routes, what paths exist through the Internet. Uh, we look a lot at participation in Internet exchange points and sort of size and growth of exchange points because that's where the Internet bandwidth is coming from. We look a lot at which countries have exchange points and which countries do not have exchange points. So countries that don't have exchange points are having to import all of their internet bandwidth from countries that do have exchange points. So the two largest producers of internet bandwidth in the world by country are the Netherlands and uh, Germany. Germany's slightly larger than the Netherlands most of the time. They're very close. Uh, but Germany has a much larger population and so consumes a lot more bandwidth than the Netherlands. So the Netherlands is by far the world's largest net exporter of bandwidth to other countries, right? Germany produces slightly more, but consumes much more. Um, the U.S. is also a net exporter. Um, Japan, Korea, net exporters. Um, but then you've got uh, something on the order of, I think, 170 countries, 180 countries that have no Internet exchange point at all. So collectively, those are the markets for the exporters. So we'd like to see more of those countries become self-sufficient and look at the economic impacts of uh, the Internet and the, the sort of net import-export costs and how much capital they're exporting to developed countries. Because by and large, these are developing countries that can ill afford to be exporting capital to developed countries just to bring in Internet bandwidth that they could be making themselves. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I think this is a fantastic data set that, uh, that people and researchers will now be able to leverage. Uh, we're very excited to have this paper and be able to dig into this data. Okay, we'll, we'll go to our, our next panelist, which is Patrick Ryan from Google, uh, which is also a, a company that has a lot of data that could be used to help us probably understand the Internet economy better. Thanks. Thank you, and I promise to be very quick so that we have opportunities for questions. Um, um, there is, uh, this is this is an area of, of, of interest, obviously, for Google. It's also something that I've been looking at for quite some time. And in fact, uh, several years ago, uh, a story that, uh, that that we used to tell and talk about quite a bit at the university. Please, thank you. At a, at a class that I would teach at the university on internet policy and on technology policy in general, we would look at disruptive technologies and how they impact uh, people's lives and how they improve people's lives and their impact on the economy in general. Um, uh, we uh, start out with the case of the video cassette recorder. And um, the uh, video cassette recorder, of course, in the 1970s and, and, and 1980s was viewed as something that was just was completely disruptive, uh, but in a bad way. Um, the Motion Picture Association hired Jack Valenti, who was a very well-known lobbyist, and in his congressional testimony, he had this horrible quote. It's really horrible, but was extremely effective when he said that the VCR is to the American public and to the American film producer what the Boston Strangler is to a woman home at night. A horrible statement, but it was extremely effective in convincing 
uh, politicians then to shut, you know, shut in the economy, shut out a lot of these new technologies. And now this is you know, continued over the course of, the, of, of several years, and I, I have to tell you, my, my wife spent some time as the, um, uh, as the director of anti-piracy for the Motion Picture Association, and so we used to have some very interesting conversations at home, uh, you know, philosophical conversations, but the motion picture industry, and in general, that content industry has been very effective at telling a story around how important their industry is to the economy, and the internet has not. It's fairly recent for us to be doing this, and to be able to talk about things like 3% of GDP in most markets, but it can grow up to 7% of GDP. I'm going to uh, sit down here in just a minute because I think we still need to have some conversations and I want to dominate it. This is a graph that shows comparatively how the internet economy, based on a number of studies, uh, fares around the world. There's 15 different countries represented. The UK is on the, is on, is on the uh, left side of the graph. Turkey is on the right. There are others uh, you know, ranging from 1% up to 7.5% you know, with, well, with opportunities for growth. I believe that looking at these things from a comparative perspective can be very valuable. Um, now, now uh, Google is facilitating, it's not our project, but we want to be sure to help you know, provide a platform for further discussion of this because this discussion is brand new. People did not talk about the value of the internet economy until really just the last year or two. And so on, on a website called www.valueoftheweb, we are um, hosting uh, locations for different uh, reports that show what the impact is in different economies, and it's you know astonishing to many. But of course, the internet economy is not uh, the value of companies like Google or the value of companies like Facebook. In fact, the contribution to GDP uh, is measured by, by a factor of 75 percent by non-internet uh, economies. It's the you know it's the it's the um, it's the you know bricks and mortar businesses that are so effective. So so please go to valueoftheweb.com. It's a great resource, and I'm going to make a plug for a uh, for a workshop tomorrow. Since uh, since we talked about the importance that speed can have in imp in improving an economy, and we're hosting with Vint Cerf and Meredith a um, uh, an open forum to talk about how best to measure. Uh, broadband speed, because we now know that broadband speed is such an important input into the economy itself. We'd love to see you all tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. What I'd like to do now is uh, open up the, the floor to questions. Um, I, I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities here, questions about what we want to measure, how we can measure it, uh, where we get the data, and uh, how we convince policymakers. So. I open the floor. If you if you have a question, if you'd please say who you are and and what you represent, and then uh, go forward with your question. Thanks. We're, we're looking for the mic. Otherwise, you can come up here and ask the question from. Uh, oh, we've got one. Hi, um, my name is Ori Okolo. I also work at Google with Patrick, but I am a policy and government relations manager for Africa. And I'm very keen on this uh, question around uh, economic impact, uh, particularly because I interact with policymakers a lot. And in our governments, getting them to, to change and update their policies without sort of this, they don't buy that the internet is a good in itself argument. So I'm, I'm very keen, particularly with uh, the two speakers on, on Facebook, which I think I'm pushing. We're doing more work through Google on uh, to cover impact on, on. But I think even in Egypt, you have the same case. Whereas previous studies, commerce, which is not very big in, in our regions, and and we don't have many online businesses. So t for for the two of you, if you could speak to. I think Facebook would be great to the extent we're seeing increasing, uh, and also um, you had mentioned South Africa. I just came to see whether uh, the work that you're doing could be extended to cover countries where think about impact beyond e-commerce and, and what you think the possibilities are there. Thanks. Yeah, maybe maybe let me give you some of my ideas from my from my own experience in working in different environment. I think for government, it's extremely important, really, um, maybe to um, to really to grasp and to understand how much regulation is affecting this kind of economy, 
like all pioneering comedy, this is not just true for the internet economy. When you look back into history, um, you can compare this. This was always true. If you come in very hard and very early with regulation and you close down and shut down markets and don't understand the effect very well, it always has an impact on your overall economy and, and your employment rate. So I think that's the, the number one recommendation, recommendation probably I would make. The same is true for investment. I think we haven't still probably are not understanding well that these economies, we are, uh, these um, sector we are talking about from the internet economy, like uh, the, the, the search um, uh, related uh, economies, like the uh, social media related economies. Um, I think what is important to understand, these are integrated, what I call personally, and economists maybe can have a better term for this, are integrated markets. Um, so a, a company might maybe the uh, original headquarter may be placed in the United States or um, when you look back for the, um, uh, for, for the music industry, actually Spotify grew out of the European market, Skype, uh, again a company, a global company was based in, in Europe. So they, they grew in one market but then they extend all over the world. So it is, I think it's important to understand the positive impact such kind of business development has on your own economy. Um, because like all these companies, they have partners all over the world uh, in, in the local markets they work with. And these local business partners are using, not just the users, but the business uh, partners are using um, such kind of uh, platform driven um, uh, sectors. So I think it's very important for you know, uh, a government in Egypt um, to understand this and to, uh, to, to really look into the positive effect it has. Because sometimes there's some jealousy. You feel, I feel this quite often in Europe, for example, why do we not have such kind of company in our market? I think it's the wrong question at this stage where we are. It's better to uh, ask the other way around what kind of positive effect brings such kind of um, um, uh, company, what do they bring or what kind of sector brings to our um, national markets. Uh, so the measurement must be different. And, and then these, as I said, these, all these companies are integrated economies. Um, and so you have to understand the, the effect such kind of integration have. I'll give you just one example. We did years ago, um, we tried to understand, when I was still in the European Parliament, how much the European economy is integrated with the United States economy, for example. Um, and then these studies were done, and now we understand this much better. We understand sector by sector how the automotive industry is, for example, integrated, or the logistic companies are integrated. And I think we have to do something similar for our uh, industry so that we really have the figures and the numbers for precisely for Egypt, how, you know, how many um, app developers are based in Egypt, how much are they profiting, where are they located in the regions, how much are they profiting, how much, uh, do they, what kind of burden do they have, uh, so that one can remove the burden, so that market access is possible for other companies to enter. But the same is true for app developers or platform developers, or what, whatever they are in this internet economy so that they, can extend, um, um, that they can extend their business. So localization is important. Understand your local data, understand your national data, understand your strengths, uh, understand your limitation, remove limitation as much as possible. This is even more than ever before an integrated global economy, so just understand it right. So to uh, address the sort of African and South African question, um, I think for us, uh, or with respect to us, it's important to understand that um, the reporting and statistics and publication side of what we do is less than 2% uh, of our work. Um, the vast majority is operations. So the .za, uh, CCTLD, um, the .africa, new GTLD, uh, these are both backed by our operational infrastructure. Um, and you know, conversely, there are 110 other countries and several of the root server operators for whom we host infrastructure in Johannesburg and Cape Town. Um, so all of these statistics are largely coming out of our operational activities. They're a byproduct of the operational activities um, that are you know upwards of 100 million dollars a year in in budget. So um, and those are certainly happening all over Africa 
uh, as well as other developing regions. That's not something where there is a, uh, a disproportionate uh, spend in developed countries. Uh, I think we're very interested in seeing a, um, partners in developing countries who are willing to match that investment with local investment, local reinvestment. For data collection within the region, so I'm interested in the reporting, not in the other. Okay, so I wasn't able to hear anything so through, but I, I think the question was, is there more potential for data collection in developing regions? Yeah, so the because most of the data collection is done in sort of uniform ways and needs to be in order to produce comparable numbers, the data collection is done in the same way in a developing region as it would be in a developed region. And I think that there's no inherent disadvantage in developing regions, um, but there are a lot of developing regions where there is simply nothing to collect, right? There's no, there's no production happening, so there's very little that can be measured, right? You can look from the position of Frankfurt or from the position of New York or from the position of Hong Kong and say how much of this bandwidth is going to uh, South Africa, right? Well, South Africa is a bad example in this case because South Africa does have a number of good exchange points, right? But, um, uh, you know, Sudan, right? You can say how much of this bandwidth is going to Sudan, uh, but you can't turn around and say within the Sudanese context, where is bandwidth going, coming from, how is it being used, because there is no point of measurement. Uh, we have a lot of questions. What I think a good idea here would be just collect some questions and we'll finish off with the panel uh, responding to the ones that they can. But yeah, lots of good things. I'm sorry we have so little time, but let's, I, I see some remote questions as well and we'll get to those at the end. Okay. No. Hello? Yep. Um, I'm Louise Bennett from the Chartered Institute of IT. Um, I wanted to know how you, were, you thought you could measure, um, particularly in companies like, network, like um, Facebook and Google, um, the fact that a lot of the economic activity is what I would call barter activity, in that the individuals or companies are allowing you to aggregate their data um, and, so to speak, sell it to other people for cheaper access. So how do you capture um, that economic activity? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you uh, for the excellent presentations. My name is Naveen Tandon and I represent the Internet Service Providers Association of India. Uh, I've gone through these slides, uh, but I have a question. Uh, whether Can you hear me? Yeah. So during the course of your research, has there been any attempt to uh, measure the impact of policies or regulations on the revenue or profitability of the service providers? Because it's very good that, and, and it's been very clear that internet has become a uh, a tool for social and economic empowerment and change. But at the same time, uh, if you look at the other side, especially the service providers, so what impact in terms of delivering of services from the, on the revenue and, 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 and impact analysis? Has that been touched upon? And I would be happy. So much. Yes, Nixie needs to be fixed. Can you hear me now? Okay, thanks. Um, Mawaki Chango from uh, APC, Association for Progressive Communications. Um, uh, Sometimes I, I tend to think that uh, the problem number one of developing countries is that uh, the government doesn't believe that much in the ingen ingenuity of uh, their own people. And, and I'm wondering whether in your research and uh, experience and uh, hence, the, the need to invest these technologies in, in the education system as uh, the delegate from Egypt has uh, uh, highlighted. 
Now, I, I was wondering whether in your research or other reports you have seen, is there any study showing how um, liberalizing these markets and uh, the impact of uh, internet on the economy may um, otherwise increase the revenue of the government because they, they, based on uh, the premise I just started with, the approach of most of the government in developing country is to look at internet industry as a telecommunication industry and, and, and think of how much they can get out of it. And, and so they are reluctant in liberal out of it. So is there a way to, to study this and, and, and uh, provide the basis for the argument that you can still get enough money for governing by liberalizing for people to be more creative uh, with the internet? Thank you. Okay, let's take uh, two more questions, and then one from the uh, remote site. Hello. Hello, my name is Paula. I'm from Colombia. And uh, my question is uh, for Theo, do you have or do you know studies or research related with digital literacy or digital skills? I mean, the impact to have people with good skills to use internet in a productive way? So my name is Radis. I'm the uh, Republic of Georgia. Do you hear me? Yeah. So uh, the problem with Georgia is that we don't have operators who control 90% of the market, and they don't want to have. They don't want. Uh, To, to have a change point and what's your recommendation what can we experience let's take one last question from the remote panel if we can put that up the question to all panelists what about gender sex disaggregated data especially important when trying to, to measure socioeconomic impact of internet economies Many governments are coming up with a lot of policies around this, especially from a developing perspective, it looks like, from Jennifer Radloff. Okay, what I'd like to do is just move down the panel quickly, and uh, you can address whichever question uh, popped out to you, and uh, it will also be your closing statement if you can take uh, one minute, and then we'll end just slightly behind schedule. Thanks. Sure, okay, so I'm going to try and... Uh give very quick answers to two questions. First, how to convince governments uh, to allow internet uh, growth when they're worried about revenue. And secondly, how governments can encourage the formation of internet exchange points domestically. So first, um, it, it is a difficult problem when a government is used to being able to extract revenue directly from a government-owned incumbent phone company. Um, this is an easy thing to do. If they own it, they can pull a fraction of the profits out and they don't have to rely upon taxation at all to make that happen. Even after they privatize, if they retain a portion of the ownership or if they have a special relationship, they can get that revenue out much more easily than they can from the private sector at large. So this is a general problem of the effectiveness of taxation. It's not a problem of the internet, right? So if you look at countries that have difficulty if you look at countries that see this as a major problem, you would find other industries in which that country would be having difficulty extracting tax revenue. And this is a, a rule of law issue. It is not an internet issue. So essentially, there's no, there's no easy answer here, but essentially what you have to do is you have to tell the government, this is not the internet's problem, this is your problem. The internet can grow and create a thriving economy, but if you want to impose 
revenue taxes, you have to figure out a way of collecting them yourself, right? This is the role of the government to manage its own taxation, right? It, we can't have a whole industry owned by the government just to make it easier to collect tax revenue. Um, and the question of how to get internet exchange points going in a country uh, from the government or regulator's perspective, um, first is just to talk with the ISPs and help educate them as to why it's better not to be shipping all their money to overseas carriers to bring bandwidth in from other countries. Um, and, you know, why you, you can talk with them about national interest as well, but just in their own individual economic interest, it is cheaper for them to use bandwidth that they're participating in making domestically than to import it all. But um, as a regulator, you can also impose as a condition of, say, an ISP class license that domestic traffic, that is traffic between two parties within the country, may not be shipped across the national border. That takes care of the problem. Um, if you have that condition in the license, they're going to have to build an internet exchange to fulfill the, their license requirements. We are running out of time, therefore I would love uh, to continue the discussion. Uh, I'm deeply interested and I would love, I don't know if it's possible for you, I'm um, not seeing that we collected actually email addresses so that we can, at least the, the people in the room which have an interest in, in collecting these kind of data, that we can continue the discussion after the, after the session. Yeah. I'll just quickly say for ICTs and skills, the OECD does have uh, research on this on papers. You can contact me directly. They're available on our website if you search for ICT skills and OECD. Um, just a quick comment uh, concerning um, the question of the colleague from Google. Uh, just want to say that also to push for this uh, e-commerce um, uh, development in Egypt, we are starting research on the subject. What is of particular value to us is to do this kind of research with the uh, companies such as Google or Facebook on, or other companies. It helps a lot put uh, the whole argument into perspective and provide the decision maker with enough food for thought that would help the decisions to be taken. So this is a trend that we're having and we're trying to have a lot of uh, um, substantive research before uh, major uh, decisions. Uh, concerning the gender, sex, desegregated data, this is a very important point. I was looking again at our statistical profile, but there is no data related to women in particular. Uh, so maybe this is something that I could discuss with our colleagues uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, so these are my comments. I think I'll, I'll speak to the revenue versus uh, growth. How, how do you convince the governments to give up uh, the revenue, since it's a, ch a challenge I face constantly, particularly in our region, uh, in countries that still have monopolies. I think what's having success, uh, the other thing they're all concerned about is jobs. Uh, the, we, and, and I think this is in most emerging markets, uh, and even, <laughs> even more importantly in, in, in the emerged or the developed markets as well with Europe and the US. Jobs is an issue globally. And I think uh, pivoting the conversation f away from revenue lo lo uh, loss into economic opportunity and the ability, what are these young people going to do? Uh, and, and the internet, they're not going to set up factories, they're not going to set up uh, uh, you know, manufacturing, and then they're not all going into farming, but there's a huge opportunity for them around technology. Uh, and, and, and looking at that, uh, at jobs in, in, in particular and, and growth is very important. Uh, I think I'll leave my remarks there since I see we're out of time. I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time and there's another group ready to start. Um, let's, I, I didn't give a chance to Lee, but if you've got questions, send them to me and I'll pass them on to the participants um, and come up and grab my email address and I'd be happy to share it with you. So thank you. Thanks to the panelists for participating. Thank you. Bye.